Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good? Daylight savings didn't get you down? <laughs> well, why don't you guys stand with us? We're going to worship. My name's Morgan, if we haven't met yet. I think I've been around enough. Hopefully you guys know me, but this is Maddie. This is my husband, TJ. This guy over here, we call him Johnny Strings. And this is Brent. Um, yeah, and we're just going to worship this morning. Praise the Lord. So, um, yeah, let's lift up our voices and sing together. the 
into a hymn, um, and if you've noticed, we've been doing a lot of hymns lately, and we just think it's so special to connect with past generations that have been praising his name for centuries and centuries, and so um, we just think it's so special to just contemplate on these words, and you might not know every word that we're saying. <laughs> um, I know I get a little confused, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it just, it just provides us a time to contemplate and um, just think on the words and think of um, just how good God has been in your life and how he is just the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's been the same um, through all the generations that have sung these songs. So let's sing together. Upon it, my 
thy hope but thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from death Interposed his precious blood, and oh, to grace, how great a debtor! Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a do too, Jesus. We know you're here working in this place right now. We thank you so much. Lord, we pray that we would always put you at the throne of our hearts, Lord. Appreciate you so much. I, if you ever doubted that TJ and the rest of this team, you can be seated. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I did that at a wedding once, too. I think we stood the whole time. Um, but if ever you think that these young people are going through the motions. I hope you caught that because that was a beautiful moment. Uh, feeling it from the heart and it doesn't matter whether Sorry, there's- Sorry, I can't make a phone call with your iPad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, electronics. <laughs> um, but truly, um, whether the song was written hundreds of years ago or whether it was written just in the last few minutes. It's so wonderful that it still comes from the heart. Um, I, would love, uh, I would love to share with you something. And I think we need to do something before we get into the word today. Um, and my Siri is just lit up, trying, trying to talk to me some more. Siri, go to sleep, go to sleep. There you go, okay. Um, you know, I, I have committed to being a, a man of prayer and, and I've tried to figure out exactly what that looks like over the years. And, and I've come to some conclusions. Um, I, I envy those of you that can literally get up every morning at the crack of dawn and spend three or four hours. I, I oof, wow. Um, what I have learned is to be a man of prayer is there are set times of prayer, but I, I, I need to be responsive when the Holy Spirit says, pray for something. And I, I, I felt that this morning. And 
And so we as a congregation, I, I want to be a praying congregation. And frankly, I don't know what that looks like yet. But I think today um, we need to pray for our kids. And, and here's the deal. We have our little ones. We have at least um, three babies that have not been birthed yet um, in, in our church family. We have little ones. And we have those that are older grade school, junior high and high school, but then a lot of us have children that might be in college or grown or grandchildren in the same way. And the way we're going to pray this morning is, is a blessing and covering over our children, our younger children, and, and those that are off to college, but also those who have strayed. And we're going we're gonna to believe the Lord to do something miraculous and to give us as parents and grandparents the, the wisdom to know when to speak and when not to speak and, and what to say and, and what not to say and, and how we're going to do this. And I'm gonna give you a, a, a couple moments. I, I want you very quietly to speak the names of the children that, that, come, that, that are part of your family. There's also, and, and we've tried not to spiritualize this, but but we, what we call spiritual sons or spiritual daughters, those people. And frankly, you know, taking away all the religious part of it, it's, it's maybe kids or people that you have influence with. And, and you can say their name. So for the next 30 seconds, and, and I'll lead us in prayer, would, would you just quietly speak those names before the Lord? They can be little ones, they can be a little bit older, or they can be those in the world and especially those that have walked away from Jesus or have never known Jesus, because I know it breaks my heart and I know it breaks your heart too. So for the next 30 seconds, quietly, just speak those names before the throne of God. In Revelation, it gives us a picture of our prayers going up before his throne. That's a sweet fragrance. And that's what happened this morning. And I love to hear him. You speak those names, man. We're speaking them, not at this church and not at this pastor, but we're speaking them before the Almighty, before the throne of God. And we're saying this person and that person. So Lord, Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that you care and you see every one of these kids that have been spoken before you. And Lord, for the little ones, the ones that aren't even born yet, those, those little ones, Lord, I, we pray your covering over them. We pray for your protection. We pray, oh Lord, that you would bless them as they grow up. And even from an early day, from an early day, they would have a sense of your love and your presence. Those in school, in grade school, in junior high and high school, we ask you to cover them in this evil day. And we ask you to protect their minds and their hearts. But Lord, I also, with the with a request for protection, pray that they become warriors and ambassadors for your gospel and for you and your kingdom. And Lord, as they go out and into a very difficult world that we live in in culture. We pray that you would watch over them, protect them, but give victory after victory as they give the seed of the gospel and your love. And Lord, we pray for those that are kids and grandkids and or kids that are just of influence that have walked away from you. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask by your Holy Spirit, to do whatever you sovereignly need to do in their lives. And Lord, we just say in the name of Jesus, please bring them back to you, touch them. May they feel your presence. May they feel drawn to you. And Lord, we just in the name of Jesus ask as those who've, 
who have influence in them, would you give us wisdom also? But we contend for our children in the name of Jesus. Let's see it with an amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, talking about children, um, we will have a quick meeting right up in the front here afterwards. And, and trust me, this is not a bait and switch where if you show up, oh, you're in, you know. Um, but we, we do have a very close target where we want to at least get our babies through maybe three-year-old. We'll talk about that, get that started. And what we're doing right now is we're organizing. We have some new voices that God has brought us and some voices that have a lot of experience. And together, it's like a blank canvas. How are we going to influence the, the little ones that come here? And so right after the service, right up here, and Sharon's going to be leading that that uh, meeting. So we're in First Timothy. We're going to be studying uh, our both letters. And as you know, I, I believe so, so strongly that one of the things that we need to do in, quote, chapter four in the latter days is to be people of the word. And whereas a lot of times we may have some topical type things that we need to teach, there's nothing like just being in the word. And Today, you'll see a distinct two-part to, to what we'll do today. But uh, these two letters, as we know, were written in the final years of Paul's life. The second letter may have been his final letter from prison before he was killed. At some point, though, Paul must have realized, because he always said in his letters, I'm planning on coming back. My heart longs to be with you. But I think he, he came to a realization that he, especially in the second letter, um, that he's not going back to Ephesus and that he's not going to be able to be with his spiritual son who is absolutely facing relentless external and internal opposition and challenges. And, and this is why we titled the study uh, In Case I Can't Be There, because he's... It, it, and, and listen, as we read this, we've identified that we are so profoundly honored to read these words from an apostle writing to his spiritual son that, that he loves realizing, especially in the second letter, this will probably be the last words he'll hear from me. So it's very, very personal. And, and we're going to get into, in the second half of our teaching this morning, we're going to see a little bit of that. But, but last week we read as Paul was describing these false teachers that, that Timothy was dealing with and he told, he commanded him, you command them X, Y, and Z. And, and that was last week. But he said something interesting. He says, they want to be teachers of the law. And that's important for our study this morning. But they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Now, as we read and listen to our passage today, we're, we're going to get a peek into some truth about the law. And I know that doesn't sound real exciting, uh, but trust me, I, I think you'll enjoy it. But we'll also see into the apostle's heart. Um, and there's several passages. This is one of them where it's just in, incredible. So this week's passage and teaching is broken up with two central themes, the law of God it's also called the law of Moses used properly. And then what it truly means to be living in his grace, and this is the caveat, despite our past. Um, let's go ahead and uh, if you have something there, if not, it'll be up on the board. First Timothy, uh, first chapter, verse eight. And it says this, we know that the law is good. And if one uses it properly, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and the religious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. That conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he trusted to me. Now, a few of these things um, are, will be a teaching in and of themselves. 
Um, but I love, uh, the, the one that interested me the most of, of the list that is here is what the NIV calls slave traders. Now, a, a, a tremendously, um, um, a book that I just absolutely love, and it's only one chapter, is, is Philemon. Now, in Philemon, the whole issue in Philemon, and we'll study that one day, uh, but the whole issue is in that slave culture that was going on in the first century Rome, there was Philemon and Onesimus who was his slave. And he has now run and Paul is dealing with Philemon, Philemon and he deals with the issue of slavery by way of changing his heart and giving him perspective. Here, boy, he is just direct on this. And so what we'll do is one day, we will talk about this probably when we go through Philemon, but this slave trader thing is intriguing because in the original Greek, it has more to do with kidnapping and, and taking somebody's life away from them. So we'll get into that as, as it goes on, but it's just, it, it's just God's word. It, God's word is so full and deep and we could go over this and then we could start all over and, and there'd be a hundred different things to look at. But I, I want you to catch this interesting statement in our passage this morning. The law is good if one uses it properly. Now listen, I know from talking to people that um, this subject of the law may not be clear to all of us. In fact, there are some who are new in the word and, and it's kind of like, damn, I, man alive, this whole law thing is just confusing. And, and there are some that just can't seem to get a handle on it, just what is the law? How does it apply to us, et cetera, et cetera? And then there's some that have studied and gotten a good handle on it. So I'm always careful to, to teach to those who are just starting, but will all benefit from it. But, but let me first say this, the Torah or the law is good. If you ever hear people talking about the law being bad, then they haven't studied well enough yet. The law is good, and I'll tell you why. Because God himself gave it, so it's good. But to understand our passage, we need to understand why God gave it to his people in the past, but yes, for us today also. The, I mean, we could read the next verse and absolutely go home, because this will explain just about everything that we need to know in Romans 3.20, when he said, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Context is everything here, you guys. He's speaking to people who spend their whole life, the Jewish community, spend their whole life following every little part of the law. And he's saying to them, no one's going to be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Paul was saying the proper use, to use his words, of the law is not a means of salvation or restoration of our relationship with God, but for us to see our sin, our brokenness, and have the opportunity to turn to the only one who can truly save us. What God's people failed to realize, even up until Paul's time, is that the improper use of God's law is to try to become righteous by keeping it. This, this is why God's law was given so many years ago, along with the sacrifices that are, that are seen in Leviticus and elsewhere. The intent of the entire law in their state of fallen and brokenness was not that his people would keep every precise command in the law, but to see their need for the provision of the Levitical sacrifices that came alongside. And we understand now pointed to the ultimate sacrifice, which of course was Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. So Paul explains the role of the law in our lives in Galatians 3 in verses 24 and 25 when he says this, 
So the law was our guardian. Some uh, translations say tutor. I like that. But so the law was our guardian or tutor until Christ came that we might be justified how? By the law? No, by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under that guardian or that tutor. Listen, I, I've noticed something and, and people in this range really, really make me fearful. But I've noticed that when people don't see their own brokenness, their own sinfulness, um, and their desperate need for Jesus, Jesus can become just useful to them as opposed to essential. We have nowhere else to go. He's the only one with the answers. And, and Jesus confirmed that the law was good, by the way, in, in case you're going, Dan, are you sure about that? Uh, well, let's, let's listen to the word, words of Jesus. And he gives us a little insight here. And it's in Matthew 5, 17. He says, do not think everybody here that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He is the only one who could, being sinless, and he's the only one that did. And he did fulfill the law. Now in our day, in the Western world we live, we hear people assure each other of, of heaven or a peaceful destination by telling each other, yes, you live such a good life. Or, or maybe in religious circles, we, we manufacture our own legalistic set of rules, standards that will somehow bring us or them to righteousness and favor with God. But Paul emphasized in Philippians 3, 4 through 6, he goes, if any one of you, he's talking in the first century, think that the law or works are, are somehow going to bring you righteousness, I'll compare resumes with you. Because he says, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh or works or the law, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. For the zeal, I persecuted the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Now this is extremely important as we read our passage this morning. Verse nine, when Paul says, know that the law is, made, is not made for the righteous, does not give us the right or opportunity to have any pride about this at all and to point and say them and those sinners, those rebels, those lawbreakers. There's absolutely no room for God's kids. We all came from a place of sinfulness and brokenness, hopelessness, and forgive me, but spiritually dead. Our hearts should be compassionate towards those who are lost and searching. And we're gonna see that clearly in a minute in Paul's own words. But let me just take a small diversion and, and forgive me for, for sounding strange here, but, but I felt like those of you joining us online, by the way, welcome, I didn't welcome you, but some of you are watching because the Lord wants you to watch what I'm about and hear what I'm about to say. The Bridgeport Church moving forward, we will be a welcoming place for everyone. No matter where you are in your life, what you have done, no matter your ethnic, racial makeup, your age, politics, marital, marital status, your current economic situation, we have room for you. But let me say this. If you are a first responder or specifically law enforcement in our culture today, you are welcome here. It will be safe for you and your family at the Bridgeport Church. We see your vocation as a call from God and we will do our best to support you as all of you 
men and women, try to stay loyal to your calling as a first responder. We say welcome. And if you want to contact me and, and talk to me first, that's okay. But you are welcome here. Amen? Amen. Now, this wasn't meant to be an exhaustive study on the law, and hopefully you don't feel that way. Um, but, but this morning, I wanted to crack the door a little bit, just because, just so we can understand the passage that we're studying and, and what Paul was referring to. So let's finish this part of our time this morning with just a couple points. You may say, but Dan, I, I had no law to point me to Jesus for Pete's sakes. And, and can, I, can I tell you a little secret? The law is even written into the hearts of people who have never heard of the Ten Commandments or anything else. Paul explains this in Romans 2, 14 and 15. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required of the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show that the requirements of law are written on their hearts, their consciences, also bearing witness. This is a direct fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 33, where God says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And oh yeah, by the way, we do have the Holy Spirit who draws us to Jesus and convicts us of sin. So wrapping up this section, let's see these simple truths. Righteousness only comes through faith in Jesus, not by the law and not by anything you can do your whole lifetime. Galatians 2.16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Once you are in Christ, you're no longer a slave to sin. Romans 6, 6 through 7. For we know that our old self, the old man, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Listen, um, there's somebody in this room do a far better teaching on this than me. But can, can I tell you something? When, when and, and those of you that are new, excuse me, new to the Bible or, or you're just getting started, the whole deal about death and everything, it, it's a perfect picture of what happened to us in water baptism because we were dead in our trespasses and sin. But you know what? We get to die with Christ. We get to be buried with Christ. And then guess what? We resurrect with Christ into newness of life. But listen, what Paul is saying to us is, you've been a slave to sin. And you know how this works. Let's say your whole life, you've been handcuffed and your ankles are handcuffed and you're walking along there and Jesus comes along and bam, knocks them off. Would it seem unusual for you to continue to walk this way for a while? Because it's what you're used to. And Jesus is saying, you're not a slave to sin anymore. And we learn to walk in victory and we learn to walk in his goodness and grace and uh, boy, we could go on on that one. But we're not only not a slave to sin anymore, but we're not held captive by the law. Romans 7, 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Again, we could spend a lot more time there, but I think we laid a decently good foundation so we can understand what talk, what Paul's talking about, about using the law properly. Now, as we finish, we're gonna finish with verses 12 through 17. You remember how we emphasized how precious and intimate these letters were gonna be. And, and Paul's gonna give us some tremendous insight into his feelings about living in God's grace despite his past. And, and 
Listen, whether you're watching online or, or whether you're here in the room, you may be carrying today shame and guilt and, and maybe uh, things from your past. You, you may have kept this to yourself um, for years or maybe your whole lifetime or you may have shared it with others, but there's a carrying of, of shame and guilt. And, and first of all, let me say this, his grace, his grace is so much larger, more powerful than anything you've done, anything. But, but secondly, and, and, and listen, you're gonna find, remember those things I talked about that we'll never allow to divide us? There are things like the, the blood of Jesus, salvation by faith, that there's just non-negotiable. But there's other things in the church where, where okay, we can have our disagreements. This might be one of those. But, but there is a belief system, and if you believe this, don't be offended. <laughs> well, and, and, and our time, in our time, and it's, it's, it's something like healing of past memories. And, and um, so I want you to take everything you've ever heard, read, or anything on the healing of memories. And, and I, when we read this and study this, um, listen to how Paul talks about his past sin and how he processed them with his current life. And, and for me personally, can I just say this? It is those memories that I still have, by the way, those memories that give me grace and mercy for others. It is those memories that reminds me of the Lord's tremendous mercy and forgiveness towards me. It is those memories that makes me appreciate his calling and completely undeserved honor to be called his son or his daughter and to serve him in whatever way he chooses. And, and it's those memories for me that reminds me that I never want to hurt my creator, my father, my friend, or others like I did in the past. So you know what? I'll keep the memories. So let's read together verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. That's a beautiful statement along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display the, his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life, verse 17. Now, and he breaks out in this prayer of thanksgiving. It's, 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 it seems strange, but it'll make sense in a second here. Now, to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the raw honesty and purity of what Paul just shared with us uh, this prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude is just absolutely a beautiful thing. I, and I want this to be a model for my life. The honesty, no false fronts, no false images or pretenses, no masks, no hiding, no covering up. I want so bad for this place to be a place people, people can come and feel like, okay, this is me. Because you know what? What did they do after they sinned in the garden? They hid themselves. And you know what we do a lot of times? Even where we should feel good with the brothers and sisters, we hide ourselves. We hide who we really are. But also we see perspective that Paul has. We see clearly who we are and who we were and who God is. And the humbleness, listen, um, when you see God's grace in this way that he's describing, we can't help 
but be humble. It's all him from start to finish. So what was he thankful for? Paul thanked God because Jesus chose him. We, we can learn something here from Paul. Listen, Paul never had a feeling that he had chosen Jesus, but that Jesus had chosen him. Now, I know you say, well, that's easy for Paul. He got knocked off a horse and blinded, right? But listen, I think there's something to be seen here. We use words like, I searched and found Jesus. And, and I'm okay. I'm okay with that. But, but really, he's the one who searched us out in the darkness, in the pit, heading towards destruction and death. Paul also thanked him because Jesus trusted him. It was amazing to Paul that after all he had done to persecute the church, to persecute God's people, and what he found out on the road was he was persecuting, persecuting Jesus, the Son of God. Then God chose him to be the chief apostle, the ambassador to the Gentiles, it was not only that Jesus had forgiven him, and that is wonderful, but it was that Jesus trusted him. It's amazing. I hesitated pointing this part out, and I even put a little asterisk, skip if you need to, but I, I think it gives us a peek into Paul and why he says some of the things. Because we hear people say, I am just the worst of sinners. And, and I've heard people say things like that, and I go, oh no. I know a guy that's far worse than you, you know. But Paul really meant that. And that's why I'm going to take just two minutes to show you just a couple of things. Because, listen, we know he was an insulter and accuser of the brethren of the church that would accuse them of crimes against God. Think about who else was called the accuser of the brethren. It's a title for Satan. He was a persecutor. He had taken every means open to him under Jewish law to try to annihilate the church, the Christian church, to just wipe them out. Then comes this terrible word, and this was what I was referring to. I, I stumbled on this in my, in my study, and, and it's found in verse 13, and it's translated in the NIV violent man. The Greek word is hobristas. It indicates a type of arrogant, sadistic action. It describes a person who is out to inflict pain for the sheer joy of inflicting it. It means to hurt and to grieve people in such a way that it brings delight in its own cruelty and in the suffering of another person. And if that wasn't enough, that he actually enjoyed what he was doing and found, found personal satisfaction, according to the Greek word, Acts 26, 11 says it all. Listen, many a time he says, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. This is it. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. He was actively trying to intimidate Christians to blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ, to walk away from their faith, to say, I want nothing to do with Jesus. I want nothing to do with this faith. He says, I'm so upset. I was so obsessed with this, with persecuting them, that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. And it is this man, in his final months and days, that proclaimed he was loved, forgiven, called, and trusted by Jesus. Now we understand his words in verse 15. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The chief of sinners became the chief apostle. That's why he ended his statement in verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is a really unusual phase and phrase in the middle of all this, but it introduces a, a statement of special importance because Paul will use this phrase five times in the epistles. But listen, sinners, broken people, shattered, evil people are not disqualified from coming to God. Why? Because Jesus came to save them. Paul, above just about anybody else, completely understood this. So Paul, in the middle of all of this, and as I, as I was reading, I pointed it out, he's in the middle of all this. Tell me he's not feeling this, much like TJ this morning was feeling it. When he breaks out in this prayer of thanksgiving, and he says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he'll go on talking, which we'll talk about next week. If, if, if you remember anything I said today, remember this. We can never lose sight of how gracious and merciful he has been to all of us. And, and listen, thank him often. If you, can't think, if you can't think of anything else to thank him for, thank him for this. And listen, when the memory of our sin and brokenness surface, don't go into shame and guilt. Break out in a prayer of thanksgiving for his mercy and his grace. Yes, I'll keep the memories because you know what? When this happens to me, I got to thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. It's so undeserved. And I get to do this too. That's crazy. Now with these words in conclusion, Paul not only gave Timothy another reason to remain in Ephesus, but like many of us, I'm sure that Timothy felt unworthy, incapable of the assignment. These words from Paul assure Timothy, if there's anyone unworthy or disqualified, it's me. Yet God found a way to use me and he will use you also as you remain in Ephesus. Would you stand with me? A new tradition that we start, started here at Bridgeport, it's in other churches, but I'm, I'm going to pray the benediction upon you guys. And if you feel comfortable, do it. Just put yourself in a posture to receive what the Lord has from his word for us. And, and Lord, after the study of your scripture, may we be people who love the law of God because our inability to keep it pointed us to Jesus, and to the good news, the gospel. And may we be people who are so thankful that Jesus did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them on our behalf. And may we be people when we begin to feel shame or guilt about the things in our past, may we remember that his grace is so much larger, so much more powerful than anything that we've done. And lastly, Lord, May we be people who always remember that although we have sinned and that we are broken people, we are not disqualified from his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his grace. We can come to God because Jesus came to save us. Thank you, Father, for this time. Bless each and every person, each and every family whether here or online, go with us, teach us to walk in gratitude and thanksgiving. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Love you, love you, love you. See you next week. Those of you that are gonna stay for the meeting, it'll be right up front here.